and the Flamingo. It has so much history. 75 years, that's really quite something. 75 years now, which is something that's a bit of a rarity in Las Vegas. Happy 75th anniversary, Flamingo. Hello and thank you so much for joining us here as we celebrate the Flamingo's 75th anniversary. I'm Kalina Estrinos. And I'm Dave Cravassier. Now from being the third casino on the Strip to now the oldest operating casino, the Flamingo has seen its fair yeah. share of history. But what was behind the origin, the idea behind the Flamingo when it was born and how was Bugsy Siegel involved? We want you to sit back and relax as we look back in the origins of the Flamingo, why it's important now to Las Vegas and how did it get born in the first place? The strip is full of glitz and glam and is covered in lights, but it might be easy to forget the city's origins as a railroad town. Las Vegas was a relatively small town until people started moving here in the 1930s. Gambling was made legal again in Nevada in 1931 and prohibition was lifted in 1933. Businessmen saw this as a great time to open casinos. And that's when a businessman named Billy Wilkerson came along. He's best known as the publisher of The Hollywood Reporter, but was also a chronic gambler. Wilkerson's son, Willie, says a chance conversation with 20th Century Fox chairman Joe Skank led to the creation of the Flamingo. My father poured his heart out to Joe and said, I'm really taking a pounding at the tables. Uh, it's only going to end badly. And Skank said, I got the cure for you. Build a casino, own the house, own the casa. Because the inference was is that if you lost, the money would be cleverly recycled. And despite several urban legends, Wilkerson was also the person who came up with the name of the casino. He had a lot of different clubs that were named after birds, and this was something like the Stork Club in New York was a famous one. Wilkerson also brought in his friend George Vernon Russell, who was the architect of the project. The budget for the project was originally set at one and a half million dollars. When you adjust that for inflation, that's more than $19 million in today's money. But at some point, Wilkerson ran out of cash. Billy started to run out of funds and he had like $200,000 left and he knew that he needed more like $600,000 to, to finish it. And uh, so he thought, well, I'll go and I'll go, go to the tables and I'll, I'll earn it back. So of course he lost it all. He then met a group of other investors from the East Coast, and they sent out here as their representative, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. And Siegel was no stranger to Las Vegas. Bugsy had already bought something down, downtown. He'd always already involved in the El Cortez. Bugsy was brought in to help finish the project, and it didn't go well. They had no clue about the construction business. Um, he, Bugsy, and so he was picking my dad's brain. Well, how does this work? How does that work? And my father was very accommodating. He said he was a great client, always paid his bills, very polite. And then things started to go south. Bugsy became very arrogant. Uh, he, he had his own way of doing things and he didn't really want to listen to suggestions or ideas or advice. And uh, he ultimately alienated a lot of these individuals who had invested in and believed in him originally. And that includes Wilkerson. Siegel forced him out so he could take over the project. And Siegel just didn't waste any time. He just said, you're going to turn over all your interest uh, to the Flamingo. And my dad said, what am I going to be paid for? And he says, you're not going to be paid anything. And you'll be lucky to be standing up. The cost to build the Flamingo eventually ballooned to over $6 million. Siegel was feeling pressure from investors to pay back loans, so he opened the Flamingo on December 26, 1946. But it didn't go according to plan. The, the casino was losing money, and they ultimately determined that they needed to close it. So he closed it for about a month while they finished the hotel room. Once they reopened uh, with the hotel rooms, they started doing better. But by then, you know, Bugsy's fate was sealed. Several months later, Bugsy Siegel was assassinated at a home in Los Angeles. Meantime, the Flamingo grew in popularity and became one of the first examples of a true resort in Las Vegas. Over the years, the Flamingo has gone through several ownership changes and remodels. 
In 1967, Kirk Kerkorian bought the Flamingo to be used as a training ground for another Las Vegas casino. And the idea was that he bought it to train people to work at the International, which is now the Westgate, which was, when it opened, was the world's biggest hotel. And when he sold the International to the Hilton Company, the Flamingo was included as well. So it became the Flamingo Hilton. And in the 70s and 80s, they did do a lot of modernization. They added the towers we see today and basically built a whole new resort. The last original Flamingo building was demolished as part of renovations in the mid-90s. In 2005, the property became part of the Harris Entertainment portfolio. The company changed its name to Caesars Entertainment five years later. While other casinos and resorts have come and gone, the Flamingo has survived for 75 years and leaves behind a legacy and footprint for others to follow. It's responded to the needs of its audiences and of, of its visitors and, and has evolved that way and managed to keep on going through all of that where others have, yeah, have, have not survived. So yes, 75 years, that's really quite something to, to still be going strong today. Mayor Carolyn Goodman and her husband, former Mayor Oscar Goodman, moved to Las Vegas in 1964. She says they came to Vegas as part of a junket to decide if they wanted to make the move to the valley. The hotel was, there was no high rise there, but the swimming pool, and it was the days where all the hotels were privately owned. Very different from today. And she says Bugsy Siegel's legacy plus wonderful customer service is the reason why the resort is so successful. I remember my husband, even at that time, loved martinis. And uh, Mr. Blake, the head bartender there, would put a pickled Brussels sprout in the martini, which I thought was very, very special. And we know an amazing experience on the Las Vegas Strip starts and ends with its employees. And the Flamingo here, they've taken the time out to honor several of their employees. 13 Action News anchor Trisha Keene introduces us to two very loyal employees who have both worked here for more than 45 years. Meet James Beats, a loyal longtime employee at the Flamingo since 1973. So 48 years ago, what was your first job at the Flamingo? It was a kitchen work. It was a kitchen work. And nearly five decades later, James still holds the same position. Well, I came here in 73, so like it had just became integrated like maybe three years earlier, supposedly. That's from, that's from what I was told. Uh, at the time, it was okay. You've worked here for 48 years. To stay in a job 48 years, you never hear about that these days. What's kept you here for so long? I needed a job for one, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a great place to work at. It really was. And through the decades, James has crossed paths with celebrities who've made their way through the Flamingo. People like Leslie Uggams, Connie Stevens, Lovelace Watkins, people like that, Gladys Knight and the Pips. I actually got a chance to talk to some of those guys. Longtime co-worker Alvin Lyons has some stories to tell. 45 years at the Flamingo. That's how long Alvin Lyons has been a table games dealer at the Flamingo on the Strip. Many celebrities have sat down at his table over the decades. Yeah, I had uh, Jane Brown came to my table, which is a, a wonderful story I always like to tell. Alvin says singer James Brown asked him for some advice on how to play blackjack. Well, the books say hit it, but you can do what you want, you know. So Jane Brown said, hit me. So I, I, gave, Jane, I gave Jane Brown a five. Jane Brown said, whoa, and then Jane Brown was so happy, and I turned over my card, I had 20, he had 21, Jane Brown was so happy, he jumped up, he said, I feel good. <laughs> That's a true story. That is a true story. Oh my God. <laughs> that is, that is, it's a nice story. Oh. I always like to tell that story. Oh my God. From James Brown to Tom Jones and legendary boxer Joe Frazier. Oh, Joe Frazier. He was talking about Ali. He said some of the nicest things about Ali. And he was a real gentleman. I couldn't believe it. But after 45 years, Alvin plans to leave the tables and retire and return to the stage. He's been singing for years with his band and he wants to pursue his other passion. So you may catch him at a showroom across Las Vegas. In a city of neon, the Flamingo's lights are unique. When we come back, we'll introduce you to the man who turned the strip pink.
Happy 75th anniversary, Flamingo. From me, Peftomatic Dragon, and little Mr. Piffles. From employees to designers, people determine the look, the feel, the success of any company, and the Flamingo is no exception. And while you might not know his name, you've definitely seen the work of Raul Rodriguez. Check it out. As the sun goes down, the neon comes up. Las Vegas rivals Paris for the title of City of Lights. Shining Bright has been part of the city's identity from the start, and casinos helped lay that foundation. With how many ended up being so close to each other on the Strip and downtown, they were always competing for um, clients to come in. So a lot of properties really began to have these elaborate, huge signs to really draw in a lot of people. In the early days, people at the Flamingo turned to a bubbly beverage for inspiration. So there was the champagne towers at that time, which um, had little bubble designs on the side and they would sparkle to kind of look like champagne. But it wasn't until 1976 that the signs we recognize today were introduced to the property. And it's all thanks to Raul Rodriguez. He actually was um, a parade float designer. He um, worked a lot on the Rose um, Parade floats for the Tournament of the Roses in Pasadena. He made over 400 floats, and a lot of them were award-winning. So he kind of took that inspiration to design the flamingo signs with the big flowery plumes. And you can see some of those designs on your screen. For example, in 2003, the city of Torrance wanted a replica of their library for the Tournament of Roses parade. But instead, Rodriguez pitched the idea of a 50-foot tall caterpillar, and they were totally on board. <laughs> In 1998, the Neon Museum interviewed Rodriguez about his career. He said when the Hilton Company bought the Flamingo, Baron Hilton asked him to create new signs. As I understand it, a lot of designs were shown to him and uh, he hadn't quite seen something he wanted. And what I analyzed was that uh, many of them were looking like signs where I interpreted the concept to be um, more than a sign but an image, an image that uh, themed the property that uh, gave it a significant flair. I was recalling that, uh, telling Mr. Hilton that, you know, across the street, there's the entire Roman Empire to work with. I had one bird, thank God it was pink, you know, and uh, I think that's part of the magic too, was the color. Uh, flamingo pink is just very inviting. But creating the designs wasn't easy. The design team had to bring in some extra help to make the creations come to life. So one interesting piece about the flamingo signage, particularly the um, feathery plumes that are very curved, they actually um, engaged with an airplane designer to make those curves in the sign. Um, because sheet metal, it's really flat and um, to bend it is quite complicated. The iconic plumes and flamingos we see today were installed in 1976. Since then, they've become some of the most popular examples of neon in the city. Raul Rodriguez passed away in 2015 at the age of 71. And while he may not be with us, his legacy lives on through his work. When I think about um, the fact that I had the wonderful opportunity to um, express myself uh, and that it became a reality, uh, Las Vegas, whenever I hear the name Las Vegas and you hear it <laughs> over and over everywhere you go, to know that I had just a little part in something that I think is so wonderful is something that I cherish uh, very close to my heart. Rodriguez is one of 11 Las Vegas icons being recognized in a new mural at the Neon Museum. The mural is featured at the North Gallery at the entrance point to the newly updated Brilliant Show. Other icons include Theodora Boyd, who was a pioneering African-American showgirl at the Moulin Rouge, and entertainer Sammy Davis Jr. and Liberace. And we have a lot more coming up for you as we continue to celebrate the Flamingo's 75th anniversary. Many entertainers have called the Flamingo home over the years, and that includes Nelson Sardelli. We'll introduce you to the singer and what he remembers most about his time in the spotlight. Plus, Wayne Newton's returning to the famous resort, why he credits the Flamingo and Las Vegas locals for saving his career. Happy 75th anniversary, Flamingo! Yes! <laughs> Welcome back and thanks again for joining us as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Flamingo. And the Flamingo has hosted many entertainers over the years, both performing here and also staying at the hotel. 
You can spot stars like Elizabeth Taylor swimming and Margaret and her husband Roger Smith celebrating their anniversary and Jack Benny playing on his very own slot machine. Plus, you can catch stars like the Supremes, Eartha Kitt, James Brown and the Smothers Brothers taking the stage. Now through the years, everybody wanted a chance to play at the Flamingo. Now I don't want to drop any names, but Kalina Estrinos <laughs> introduced me to a guy who played a lot of gigs at the Flamingo. Yes, we're talking about Nelson Sardelli. He is 87 now, and if you ask him, he'll tell you all about the stars he met back in his day. I was the last opening act for Judy Garland. And I was doing very good, you know, considering that they didn't come to see me, they came to see her. Without even trying, Nelson Sardelli is an entertainment historian, just by virtue of having worked very closely with a whole generation of iconic performers at the Flamingo. When you brought a Sinatra to the city, when you brought a Dean Martin, a Sammy Davis Jr., almost like the, the whole city vibrates, you know what yes, I mean? Yes, yes. yes. Well, and, was... and then Elvis came and, yeah. It's one thing to drop names, but quite another when Nelson shows you his impressive collection of photos with all those big name stars. That's him in the back, the handsome young guy next to Joey Bishop and the rest of the Rat Pack. As I tell people, I am not a great singer, I'm not a great comedian, I'm not a, a great gun twirler or a dancer, but I'm the best Nelson Sardell you can find anywhere. <laughs> Sardelli claims he was on the periphery of the headliner shows, but he admits he used to pack them in as a performer in one of Flamingo's lounges. Those days you had like four weeks booking at the time, two shows a night, a, a big orchestra, you know, even though we were in the uh, lounge, because the main room was here, the lounge sets um, set almost 400 people. Starting in the 70s, and now almost 50 years later, Sardelli, who is from Brazil, says he'll never leave Las Vegas. It's his home. You know, Vegas is always Vegas. I, 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 don't, I don't see me residing or living anyplace else. This is, this is, I found my place. Mr. Las Vegas himself credits the Flamingo for helping his career take off. While Wayne Newton had been coming to Las Vegas for years, the Flamingo gave him his first shows as a headliner in the 60s. He says some people told him he'd fail but he's thankful the casino gave him a chance. They were taking bets that I wouldn't do very well. As would have it, the local people of Las Vegas came out to see my show and save my career. And you're still doing it. Wayne Newton is planning on returning to the Flamingo soon for his show, Up Close and Personal. He was originally set to perform in October, but had to postpone the show due to a back injury. Let's face it, the world famous resort just wouldn't be the same without its namesake. And when we come back, I'll show you how they're taking care of a flock of flamingos here in the desert. Happy 75th anniversary, Flamingo! Welcome back. Now, one thing that makes this place so special are the flamingos. And for more than 20 years, thousands of people have come right here to meet them and learn all about them. Yeah, we talked to the curator who says they each have their own personality and names to match. We've got Bubblicious and Blackjack and Bugsy and Alpha and Omega and um, just the whole nine yards. That is Robin Matos. She's from Hawaii and moved here to help set up the wildlife habitat, which was officially established in 1995. People keep asking me, when are you going to retire? And I said, why? I have the best job. I, I work in this beautiful garden with animals. Everybody's happy to see me and they don't talk back. And she's probably pretty happy about that because she says one of the birds is a bit of a bully. Some of the background for you, the birds here, they are Chilean flamingos native to South America. They eat different varieties of fish and more and typically live up into their 40s. The wildlife habitat is home to more than 60 exotic birds, 20 turtles and more than 300 fish. And we want to thank you for joining us for this special look back. And we have one more thing we have to do. Ready? Ready? One, two, three. Happy, Happy 75th, 75th anniversary, anniversary Flamingo! Flamingo.